My name is Monk Rowe, and I'm very pleased to have Eddie Locke here with me today in, in New York City for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. I've been looking forward to talking to you because I, when I talk to people on the phone, I get a certain vibe, <laughs> and you seem like an interesting guy. Well, you know, I've had, this has been, music business has been nice for me. Great. Yeah. And I always tell people, I said, if I, if I never played any more jazz, or if I never played any more music, my soul has been satisfied because I was very lucky. You know, I played with Coleman Hawkins mm -hmm. and Roy Eldridge. That is something for be that lucky as yeah. young age I was. So yeah. to play with one of them would have been good, but I played with both of them individually and I mm -hmm. played with both of them together. It was like, I mean, I, I mean being fulfilled jazz music wise, mm -hmm. not only jazz, and they were such good people, mm. wonderful human beings. That really um, goes along with their legend, doesn't it? Just yes. the fact, I mean, yes. they were great players, but also great people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, um, the things they did with that, with that quartet that we had with Major Holly and Tommy Flanagan and myself, I mean, he treated us like um, a fat, we was like a family almost, you know? Yeah. And I, I tell people, they, they don't believe what they hear. You know, we made, must have made about 10 albums. Mm -hmm. We never, ever rehearsed, not one time. Not once. <laughs> and some people don't believe it, but we yeah. never did. That's the part of jazz that I think that people don't understand. It's more than the rehearsing mm -hmm. and the technique. The music is about the people. Mm -hmm. And that's what, especially, it, I think any music, but jazz especially, because it's not, you know, the technique thing is not necessarily the means, <laughs> you know that. Yeah. To make the music. Let's make some music together. Are there certain bass players that you've experienced that, like, right away, yeah, I know. It really clicks? Oh, yeah. Or the opposite? Or oh, the opposite. You're right. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. The time thing is very uh, elusive. It's not. It's not like. To, to, as Papa Joe Jones used to say, jazz is something special, just like classical music is special in its idiom. But jazz is just as special in its idiom because it's, it's different. Mm -hmm. And uh, the time thing is completely different. And when you're playing jazz, you know. Oh, God, I don't know, was it an old guy or a young guy always told me? I told these kids up at this college I went to, a lot of people have never heard about the pendulum and, 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 t and the time. Mm -hmm. It's a pendulum. You know, you can go from like one, two, three, four, like that, or you can go one, two, three, four. You get that at the same time. But this part down here is where the swing is. <laughs> oh, I like that. I know a professor told like me that it. at this other school. He said he had never heard that before. I've never that heard that. That old guy before. told me that a long time yeah. ago. Yeah. Uh -huh. so that's true. where the swing that, is, that's right? Yeah. yeah, but you're getting that at the same time. You could, you could, the, most guys play like this. Uh -huh. Boom, 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 boom. But if you play this, that's another, that's the swing. That's mm -hmm. the time. And that time is the same place. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> Well, let me take you back a little bit, if we okay. can. Okay. Um, a lot of great musicians came out of Detroit. Oh, boy. It was it? A, quite an environment. Uh -huh. It was wonderful. It was sharing. You know, they said, um, I, I heard a guy say one time that, uh, I don't know what his name is. I always mix him up with, he played, uh, in Malcolm X, he played Elijah Muhammad. I can never, he teaches out at Howard University. Oh. I can't think of his name. I always mix him up with the other famous, you know, black actor who, oh. you know, that gets all the Oscars. And oh. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. He was driving Miss Daisy. He was in that. Oh, Morgan Freeman. Yeah, but it's, this is not him. Oh, I mean, no. oh you, that's the guy you mix, mix him up with. But he's, okay. I think he's actually, or well, anything, and what I was going to say, what uh -huh. we were talking about, he said that, um, they said guy was telling him how much he, he was a great teacher. And he said, you know, you can't really teach anyone anything. He said, you just create a good environment and they will learn. Mm -hmm. And that's true. Because that's the environment we had with the quartet. It was a wonderful environment. And so the music was wonderful. The environment created the, all the music. Because I've been around just musically great musicians, but the environment was not, uh -huh. didn't, it didn't make the music. 
but didn't make the music. But yeah. Detroit was a great place. You know, all those people that were there, just to think that many great musicians came from one place is just uh -huh. astounding sometimes to me. Did you, um, was there people in your high school even? Oh, yeah. yeah every, like every, you know, because it was a big area in my high school, in Miller High School, that's where mm -hmm. I went to Miller High School. It's the same school Bags went to, Mill Jackson went to mm -hmm. that high school. And uh, Kenny Burrell went to it, Oliver Jackson. And, you know, because it was about, it must have, because Detroit was a big area, so very spread yeah. out. It yeah. must have been seven, eight, nine high schools there. Because Tommy Flanagan went to a different one. Roland Hanna, Roland Hanna and Tommy went to the same high school. Barry Harris went to a different high school. You know, we used to play amateur shows together, you know. I always tease Barry Harris about that, you yeah. know. It's a place called the Paradise Theater. It was like the Apollo. Uh -huh. You know, we had our band, you know, and yeah. uh, he had his band. But Barry Harris has always been an organizer, even when he was young. Because I always tell him, I said, man, we had the best band. Because, but, you know, after, after, you know, everybody played, then the guy would go, you know, hold the card over your head, oh, yeah. and then the people would clap. And, you know, he held the card over our head, and the people clapped. When they held the card over Barry's head, boy, the, the theater went crazy. I said, boy, he wasn't that much better than us. You know what he had did? He had, they had on their high school sweaters, and he had every kid from that high school was in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. But that was the kind of fun we had, yeah. you know. You know, Elvin and I were very close when we were in Detroit, you know. Mm -hmm. And Oliver Jackson. Well, you do know that's how I came to New York. I had a song and dance team. Yeah, Bop and Lock. That's right. Tell you know, me you about Bop and about Lock. That. Huh? Tell me about that. Well, did you ever hear of Red and Curly? I don't know. They used think to so. travel with Atlanta Hampton. Okay. Well, the first time I saw them, they were with Erskine Hawkins, man. They had a drum act like that. And they were tap dancers. Mm -hmm. They were basically tap dancers. Ours was the exact opposite. We were drummers and jive tap dancers, you know. <laughs> but we did this all ourselves, you know. And I think we must be the... We rehearsed for about two years putting this act together. And Tommy Flanagan and all, all the guys used to accompany us and help us. And uh -huh. Pepper Adams, they put bands together and play our music for us, you know. That's the way the guys were in Detroit, mm -hmm. you know. And, and we, we decided we were going to try to make it with this act. And we probably would have been better, but it was at a bad time. When, when, that, when we got that act together, that's when vaudeville was dying. That's when rock yeah. and roll came. That's when the, all the tap dancers and everything went like kaplut. How, help me out with the times here, maybe 48? Uh, well, we came here in 54. Okay. But we got booked into the Apollo Theater, which was unheard of. Uh huh. That was the biggest, you know... That was one of the biggest vaudeville houses ever been. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have no name. We only had played once in Detroit. And this agent saw us there. And we played at the Colonial Theater. And, and uh, then he, he, I guess he submitted us to the Apollo. And they, and they accepted us. And that was really something, you know, for you know, this to come right from Detroit to the Apollo Theater, you know, in New York City like that, that was like, Astounding for me. You guys nervous? <laughs> was I <that> nervous? <laughs> when we got off the train, we rode the train here. We got off at Park Avenue and 125th Street. And when we came down those steps, I was scared. To, I'd never seen that many people. It was in July. I had never seen that many people on the street before in my life. You know, it was like, ooh, I wanted to go right back up those steps, man. <laughs> it was very, very funny to see. Mm -hmm. And I asked somebody, was it a parade? Because I've never seen all these, never seen that many people on the street at one time like that. Uh -huh. And that was the beginning. And we, you know, we played the Apollo, and we made the whole week. You know, after the first show at the Apollo, um, Mr. Schiffman, he always watched the first show. You know, that was the guy that owned the Apollo. And then, if he calls you into the office, it's usually tell you that you got to go. He would pay you, but he didn't want you on the, he did say, he didn't, if he didn't like the act, uh -huh. mm -hmm. you had to go. And after we did our first show, they, they had a little speaker system, you know, they said, uh, Bop and Lock, Mr. Schiffman's office. Uh, and, and all the other acts that were on the show said, oh, man, I feel sorry for you guys, man. Because usually when he called, when, when he, we went in his office, you know, and he said, you know, 
You guys got a nice little act, but I'll tell you one thing, though. Cut out those jokes. <laughs> <laughs> we had some terrible jokes. You know, you know where we got the jokes from? We sent off in the back, you know, years ago in the back of comic books and things. You could send off for a joke book. Really? That's what we did. <laughs> And I still got it. I still you got still got the book? Yeah, I oh, still got great. the joke book. Yeah. <laughs> he said, you, you can stay, the band, you can do the dancing and the drumming, singing, no more jokes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so now you had to fill some more time. Well, Tommy you Flanagan, think? you know, he used to accompany us, you know, uh -huh. and help us too. And one time, you remember Leonard Silman? No. Smart Affairs? He used to sing. That's where Eartha Kitt came from, oh, Roger okay. Clary. He was called... Leonard Silman, he would get all these young people, he would find these new faces. He called them like new faces of 1949, uh -huh. new faces 1950. And every year he would audition, and then he would put a show together and take them around the country. Eartha Kitt, all these people came from that guy, Leonard Silman, yeah. that's new faces. Robert Clary, a couple of those good, great guys. But anyway, we auditioned for him, and Tommy was our accompanist. So. Mm -hmm. And it was in a theater, so Tommy was like down in a pit, and we were up on a stage, and he was sitting right there. So Tommy said, yeah, man, you guys came out and you were singing, and he was mm, smiling and everything. Yeah, I played the drums, he was smiling. He said, you start telling those sad jokes, man. And he said, <laughs> he always, Tommy always tells me, everybody that, he said they, start, they saw him scratch your name <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah. Well, what were a couple of the tunes that you would have done in that? In that well, we wrote the tune. We were, oh, our wrote opening tune was called Drummer Man. Uh-huh. We wrote that, and then we did things like Lover for the drum pieces. We were mm -hmm. synchronized drumming, where we did, we had two complete drum sets, and, and each hand was doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so it was, uh, and, you know, it was not like the day people have got video. I'm sure I wish I had a video or something yeah, of it. Yeah, it would be nice. It would be. <laughs> and I, you know, I got some still pictures, a couple of still pictures, but that's all. So now you're a young man in... In New it's York. A big city. Well, the dad couldn't go anywhere because that, that type of show business was dying yeah. at that time. You know, Cozy Cole told us you guys were good, man, but you just came along at the wrong time. Uh -huh. You know, and um, so we started, first we just started, you know, trying to get little gigs, you know. We had a few other little jobs with the act, but nothing really to sustain mm -hmm. us. So we both just started kind of trying to play the drums, and we met Papa Joe Jones, who... Uh, took us into his apartment and kept us for about, we lived with him for about two years. Is that right? Yeah, on 44th Street in the Henry Hotel. It was, you know, those guys were just special people. Gee. You know, yeah, yeah. And uh, we've got jobs. I worked at Macy's and did stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know. So he said, you got to take care of, they taught me of the values about life that was still great for me right now. Mm -hmm. So you got to take care of yourself, you know. If you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be able to play the drums. You can't say I'm a drummer and you're not working, working you know. <laughs> yeah. You got to eat, you got to just take care of it, your parents, all that stuff, you know. Uh -huh. Those guys were, I mean, I, <clears throat> I learned so much, I'm still living off of it. <laughs> Neat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we lived with him for about two years. Two years. And he was with, um, was he... He was on the road some of that time. Well, that, that was I was doing still still in the time of the Jazz of Philharmonic. He was doing that kind of. This was like '57, '58, uh -huh. right around the time that big picture was taken. Oh yes, the great Dan Harlem. Yep. So that's how I'm, why I'm on the picture. Yeah, that's how I happened to be on the picture. Right. Because oh, because of Joe him. Jones. He said meet. He, he used to. I used to carry his drums to record dates and set them up and, you know, carry his drums and you know get coffee for him and all that stuff like an apprentice. Yeah. Which young guys won't do that now. Oh. I learned so much that it's just like, you're talking about a college, that was like, yeah. you know, just watching him play in all these different venues. You know, he got carriage drums, set them up, take them down, you know what I mean? Take them home for him if he wanted to go somewhere else. Yeah. And he told me one day, he used to say, well, meet me here. That's all he would say. I couldn't ask him no questions about it. And when I got off the train up at 125th Street, and I was walking down the street, and I saw all these people standing out in front of them, this apartment, I said, God, did Joe Jones invite me to a funeral? I don't even know these people. I, mean, I thought it was somebody. <laughs> oh. And when I get there and I see all these musicians, I was like, I couldn't believe it. 
And so I didn't know any of them then. Later, I played almost everybody on that picture. Mm -hmm. But at that time, and, and like I said, the way I was raised and where I came up, I, was, I wouldn't have dared went up to Roy or Coleman Hawkins and said, hello, I'm Eddie Locke. You know, no, I would never do nothing like that. You know, yeah. I would never do nothing like that. And why I'm standing on the picture next to Horace Silver, because Doug Watkins was playing with Horace Silver at that time, the bass player uh -huh. from Detroit. Okay. So I knew Horace because of that. That was the, to talk to. Uh -huh. I knew who all of them were, yeah. but not to walk up to them and just start talking. So that's why I'm standing at that point where mm -hmm. I am. Boy, yeah. I bet you're glad you went, though. Oh, I, oh of course <laughs> I am. And you know, they couldn't identify, so funny thing about it, they couldn't identify me when they got the whole layout done. Oh. They, had, they knew everybody in Esquire was going crazy because I met some people later on that knew were there. Oh. They said, it was in, oh, who is this guy? And they were calling all the studios and all the record companies and all the agents, but nobody knew me. <laughs> You know what I mean? Well. And you know who identified me? The only person that identified me? Uh, Billy Crystal's father, Jack Crystal. Really? He was a, he ran a place down in, on 2nd Avenue they, where they've had uh, college kids went. Mm -hmm. Every Friday and Saturday night, they had jazz. And Joe Jones used to play there, Roy Eldridge, Charlie Shavers, Willie the Lion Smith. And I used to go down there every week with Joe, whenever Joe played there, mm -hmm. and just sit, you know? And uh, that's, so he, he identified me. Well, that's great story. That was, that was something. That was really funny. He said, man, the people were going crazy. Because I met the people that squad later. Nice. Yeah. They said, man, we done got this whole layout done. And, they, and the and editor said, you, what, how do you got this guy on here? You can't identify him. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> wow. But I fit there now. I yeah, belong there. So it worked right. out. <laughs> that's right. You, you justified your presence for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that well, was a great, yeah. What was it about Joe Jones drumming for you? He that? was the most, cre he is the most creative drummer I ever saw. They could create things that I'd never seen anybody else do. Mm -hmm. He had this kind of mind about the drums. Well, actually, the first time I saw him, the first time I ever saw him play was in Detroit. You know, they had a Paradise Theater, where they, just like the Apollo, where, you know, they had those theaters every, in all the big right. cities. And he was there with Basie. And they did this thing they called brushes, where the big band is just going, and, and he's playing with the brushes, you know? And he never picked the sticks up, and he, he, but he always made you, give you that impression that he was. I mean, he always yeah. like it was going to happen. And then he took a solo. The band cut out, and he took the solo with the brushes. And I had never seen nobody do nothing like that. It was like he was, he was a magician with those brushes. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was great with it, but he was, I've never heard somebody play brushes the way he could. He was a magician, you know. Yeah, he was something. Because I remember with his funeral, Roy Haynes, when I was talking, you know, and I said, somebody had put some sticks on his body, you know, on his hands. Oh. And I said, I said, boy, I said, some, I said, and he was sticks, I said, but those brushes, man, he's somebody, but, and Roy Haynes held his hand up and reaches in his pocket and says, I brought some. <laughs> wow. I mean, I've never seen anything like that before. Every drummer, it couldn't have been no one playing drums nowhere that day, that <laughs> day, that evening. I've never seen that many. I've been a lot of those affairs, just funerals like that, you know. I've never seen nothing like that before in my no. life. Hmm. Never. No. He had touched so many. I can't think of no drummer that ever saw him play. If you got any kind of brain, you had to get something. Because he just had so much, he just threw away so much stuff. <laughs> I'm still trying to get some of it, you know. As Max Roach always says, for every beat I play, I owe that old guy five. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, yeah, yeah. And the sound of the, the bassy rhythm section. Ooh. About that. <laughs> that thing was just like, just like the wind. It was so smooth, you know. And this drummer, the drummers then, all the drummers from that period, as far as I'm concerned, and I've, came, I've, I've come up with a theory about it, that all the drummers from that period had great touches on the drums. The touch they had, Gene Krupa, Buddy Rich, or Joe Jones, Sid Catlett, they had this nice touch, the sound that they got. Mm -hmm. 
And I've noticed that all the modern drummers, a lot of them have a lot of technique, but they don't have no touch. The touch on the drums is not, is not like those guys' touch. Mm -hmm. And you know what I, my theory on it is that, I just, all, this came to me one day, I said, somebody, somebody young guy was asking me, uh, when I was young, did they have plastic heads? I said, no, man, there was no plastic heads. I said, it were calf heads. And I said, every place you played, it, it affected the weather and, and the lights affected that head. You could come off the stage one minute and you've been playing, and when mm -hmm. you go off for the intermission, when you come back, they'd be different, you know, from the heat or the moisture or what. Yeah. And so you had to really learn how to use the technique. You couldn't do nothing about it. You couldn't play the same way every time. No, you had to develop, You had because uh -huh. that, that thing wouldn't respond. Yeah. You know, they would get mushy. If you went someplace somewhere that was really, you know, hot and this guy's getting damp, they would, that heads would just get like, whew. You know, it would get mushy, man. And you had to develop something, way to play on that. And it made you concentrate on that, too. And every drummer from that, I just, I took, I was, I, and then I started really checking it out after I thought about it. I had never thought about it before. Mm -hmm. See, because on plastic heads, you just, they stay the same all the time. Yep. You know what I mean? So now you're, you're just beating on them. But you couldn't do that with, a, with calf heads. I mean, mm -hmm. you could whoop and the thing wouldn't do nothing. <laughs> you had to learn how to do something on it yeah. to make it sound, you know? You yeah. had to play off the head. You couldn't play into it like that. Yeah. Because it would just go boo. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so consequently, these developed this you had to touch. It, because, yes, it yeah. made you. You were forced to, mm -hmm. you know? And that's, that's one of the things that I really miss when I listen to a lot of drummers. They all got the great technique and all the hands. And right. That. But that, that, that part is, I don't hear that like I used to yeah. hear it. No, man, those guys had such wonderful touch and ideas. My first good job was in the Metropole. That was my first big time job, uh -huh. right on 7th Avenue. And they you know, had music from the morning to, to the, from noon. They had more music from like, Three o'clock in the afternoon to four o'clock in the morning. Two bands changed. Like we played from three to seven. New bands come on, bigger bands. You know, two. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget when I first started playing there, I thought I was pretty good. Yeah. Of course, of course, young, fly, right? Zooty Singleton was the other drummer. Face, he calls everybody face. He calls him face? Face. Yeah. He calls everybody face. Okay. <laughs> and I you know, found out why they did that. He never had to remember his name. Right, like, like hey, face the gates and gates, then, yeah, right, right, right like Brown Lampins and pops, yeah. <laughs> so you didn't know whether he really knew you or not. I ain't doing face, you know. But he, I said, oh man, you know, I didn't really, I knew about him, but I really didn't know him that well. So I was gonna go up there. I'm gonna kill this old guy, right? Because they had drum battles. That was a drum room, mm -hmm. the Metropole. That was a drum house. It, you know, there's certain houses. It was long stage. Long behind the bar. Behind was the it? bar, yeah. yeah. Everybody played there. Uh -huh. So I go up there, man, and I I was working with Tony Perendi. It was just a trio. Tony Perendi playing clarinet, and Dick Wellstead was playing mm -hmm. the piano, who we, I got very fond of. He was the first, only the young guy could ever do that stuff. Uh -huh. He really could do that stride and stuff. He really had, he was one of the best young guys I ever heard do that. So, you know, they had these little drum battles, and I'd do all my little drum, and he would say, rat, da, 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 da. and he had little ratchets on his drums, and he said, rat, da, 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 da. and the people would go crazy. I said, no, something's wrong with this picture here, you know, what am I doing? <laughs> so I started watching this guy, man. I said, man, I think I'm tearing up, tearing it up, and the people ain't paying me no mind at all. You know, they said, this guy is killing me every day. <laughs> So I got to be really good friends with him, yeah. man. And just watch them, that presentation was, was, that's what those guys could do, you know. Mm -hmm. That was, you know, I would be doing all that stuff and he would, dink, 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 and hit a little bell, ding, or <laughs> something, you know. <laughs> it was beautiful. And they were just, he was, I mean, they were all so nice to me, and wonderful mm -hmm. people, you know. And that's what I learned. I watched all those guys, man. Uh, you know, like Buddy Rich played there. And all these guys, you know. 
Buddy Rich, I could talk to Buddy Rich because Buddy Rich knew I liked Joe Jones. And if you liked Joe Jones, you were okay with Buddy Rich. <laughs> if you didn't like Joe Jones, I'm telling you, he loved Joe Jones. You know that, though. Mm. He loved Joe Jones. If you didn't like Joe Jones, <laughs> don't talk to, to me. Buddy Rich. That's right. <laughs> Please don't. don't. <laughs> That's great. Tell me about, I've been waiting to get to uh, the 15 years you spent at uh, Ryan's. Oh, yes. Wow. That's a long time for it. Well, Roy Eldridge was my, um, well, let's say he was my conscience. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, he was, uh, he was like my, I don't know what to call him. I, have, I had a great relationship with him and Coleman, but there was, the both of the relationships were very different. And Rogers was the godfather of my children. Mm. I became, you know, like it was like my family, you know. And those guys, they never, you know what I really loved about them? They never, ever BS'd me about what I could do. You know? And they would say, he'd say, you're not, you're not great, but you're okay. Just keep doing what you're doing. You're all right. You know, they didn't put that stuff in your head like, you're the greatest drummer ever. So, you know, just the, for, to say things like that. I think that's one of the worst things that happens to a lot of young musicians today. They make a CD or record or something, and somebody tells them that they're the greatest thing that's been here, you know, all that, and they don't grow anymore. I'm still no. growing. Mm. <laughs> I'm better now. I can play better now than I could 10 years ago. And you know what I mean? And I think it's coming from that, you know. They, I mean, they, they, they were, you knew they liked you because they wouldn't have, you wouldn't have been there. Mm. But they never were less like polishing you off up all the time. Mm -hmm. you know, how great you are and oh, you did, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's, you know, you, you were there, it's okay. You know, and they, re and they treated you nice if you did what you were supposed to be doing. Like, as Papa Joe said, take care of the bandstand. That's another thing those guys did. When they went up on the bandstand, it was a business for them. And they took care of the bandstand, the music part, everything. As Joe didn't say, you know, like, you got to know how to get on the stage, you got to know how to get off the stage. You know, don't wear out your welcome, neither. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Terrific. Yeah. And they could do so much with a little. You know, they never, they never ranted and raved a long time. And that's another thing I learned from them is that was a, that's, a, that's something wonderful to be able to do. Tell your little, get your little piece done, mm -hmm. and don't wear the people out. Yeah. You know? Two choruses instead of eight. Yeah, instead yeah. of eight. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And do tell the story. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, uh, it was, it was a, I, like I said before, I, I was, I must have been the luckiest. And I thank God for it. I'm not going to go to church all the time, but I do. I thank God for it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. But that was that was really luck. You got to be good, but you got to be lucky too, yeah. a little bit. <laughs> Roy had quite a competitive Ooh. spirit, didn't he? I, listen, <laughs> I've never played with anyone that loved to play as much as him. Never. And my greatest story. Every time I tell somebody this, they always say love it. But I'm gonna tell it so this will be in, on film forever. Yes. I'll never forget we were playing in a place and it was no one in the place. It's just like this room we're in now. Mm -hmm. But the band, we were up there playing, and I was just back there. And he turned around and he looked, leaned over the drum set at me. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, Roy, man, I said, there's nobody in here, you know? I said, look, he said, he looked me right in, I mean, he got closer. He said, I'm here. It was the scariest thing, I mean, in the way he said, you know what I mean? Yeah. But it made, it made a difference in me. He said, I'm here. It was play, because that's what he did. I mean, I've heard him play to some of the greatest music I ever heard in a room just like this with nobody in it. Uh -huh. He would just—he loved that horn. It was just like, you know, that's why when he did his funeral, when Dizzy said, <laughs> he said, y'all got to find something else to do now, he said, because this, this is the only person who was ever named jazz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Said he's the only one was ever named jazz, and that's what he was. He, I don't. I've seen him. I'm. I mean, Joe Jones told me said one of these days, you're gonna be playing with him, man, and he's gonna take you out of that drum seat. He's gonna lift you right out of that drum seat. I, I see, man. Now that is really deep. I didn't pay that much, but he did. Yeah. Right up in Toronto one time. Really? Man. Oh God. You know, I had this feature on Caravan that we did, and when he got to the bridge one time, boy, 
I mean, he did, I mean, it was just like, it was so dynamic. It's just like, I, I couldn't do, I couldn't even play. It just took me away, I'm telling you. It was like, wow. it was unbelievable. I never felt nothing like that before in my life. It was just his presence when he played was just like unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, I mean, mm. like I said, I've heard him every night. I've never played with him. You know how long I played with him. But I played with him before I played in, in Ryan's. Mm -hmm. And never a night, he's the only person I've ever been around like that. It was never a night where, and sometimes in the night I said, wow. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, he would do something that I had never heard him do before, like this sub so dynamic that it would be just like, whoa. <laughs> that was amazing. Wait. It was amazing. It made you play better than ever, I would ever. imagine. That's right. Oh, he brought to, oh yes, <laughs> oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Because he would, he would just, he say, he'll tell you. I'll play the job by myself if you don't want to play. And I can do it. <laughs> and he could. Because <laughs> he loved to play. When he got up there and got that, he was just like a little kid with a toy. Mm -hmm. No, no. It was like a little kid at Christmas time. Every time he played, when he was playing, it was just like, I've, it's, I've never felt nobody play like that. I tell so I see some of these trumpet players now, and I say, boy. I mean, and I've heard all trumpet, every place we played, all the greatest trumpet players in the world I've met. Mm -hmm. Classical trumpet players, too, I'm talking about. And the one guy told me, we said, uh, he said that, and this guy was one of those great Hollywood guys that did all those big films, and he told me, he said, listen, he said, that guy defined the trumpet. That's something. Mm. And they never studied it. You know, he never studied. Yeah. The guy, guys used to come in and say, look at him, man. He's pressing the wrong valves and playing the right <laughs> notes. <laughs> That's uh, yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. He said he's, play, he's pressing the wrong valves and playing the right notes. <laughs> I'm curious, was he, what kind of physical shape was he in? Well, he was in Did good shape until he got the rest of when his wife when his wife died. That was when he... Yeah. To succumb to his age, you know okay. what I'm saying? I'm just, you know, when you when you uh, you watch the films and there's so much, Ooh. so much energy. energy. I've never seen. You know, that's what like, I'm trying to tell you. Wow. I've never seen. I mean, sometimes he would start playing and it would just like you you couldn't you can't you couldn't believe that this guy could keep b building. That's another thing they told mm. me about building a solo. Uh -huh. They built a solo. They know how to build a solo. These guys don't know how to solo like that now. They, he would just keep building it, man, until he got to that peak where he wanted to get. You know what I mean? And it was, and, and it was just unbelievable. I, I've never been in, I've never felt nothing like that, you know, that, that, that kind of energy. Mm -hmm. I could feel it in myself when he was playing, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, he'd hit some of those notes sometime, and he would just, you, you know, <laughs> woo! What's going on here? Yeah. He was amazing. He was really, truly, and you know that Dizzy always says that. Say that guy was that was it. Because he had this this other thing about him that he he loved it so much that if you got on the stage with him to play, I don't care whether you was playing a juice harp or a piccolo or whatever. When you got up there to play, you were you were in confrontation. It wasn't, he didn't, he, he didn't care nothing about, he, he wanted you to, you, you had a battle on your hands mm -hmm. if you came up there to play with him. That was just it. You know, it didn't, he was not, and it, it was just something like second nature to him. I mean, he don't plan it, but if you got up there and started playing a horn, I don't care what kind of horn it was. It didn't have to be no trumpet. Any kind of horn. You had the trouble, you had some trouble on your hands, pal. So he, he was not, uh too shy about wiping people out. Oh, that's all. That he was just, he was, <laughs> ooh, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. He was just like fierce with that. Mm -hmm. And one of my stories I told her at his funeral when Dizzy was there, so I never forget, Dizzy was coming down the street one day. It was like at the festival time. It's like this, like, like this hotel's got a lot of musicians around. It was summertime, and we used to stand out in front of Ryan's on the intermission, you know, out on the street, you know, and Dizzy had his horn, he was coming down, as he came down the street, and 
He got up today. He said, how you doing, Jazz? And he put the horn down on the floor, on his ground, you know. He said, listen, Jazz. He said, you know what? He said, I want to play tonight. He said, but could I play by myself? <laughs> he said, because, man, I don't feel like that tonight. And you don't know how to act, so we, could I just play? Roy said, yeah, you can go play by yourself. But that's just, it was just a beautiful thing, you know. <laughs> this, is, this is what I'm talking about. He knows yeah. if Roy gets up there with him, He's going to start that screaming and whistling. And all. Dizzy, said, Dizzy said, I'm not for, I'm, listen, I just, could I go up there and play by myself? He said, because you don't know how to act. You know that, man? And I don't want to, I can't be bothered with that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You say your relationship with uh, Coleman Hawkins was important but different. It was completely different because they had yeah. character. That, but that's what the jazz was made jazz so special because all these guys get character-wise. Mm -hmm. They were girl grimmers, but they were different emotionally about certain things, you know. Mm -hmm. Coleman, liked, Coleman liked to listen to classical music, you know. We sit up in his apartment with him, Tommy Flanagan, Roland Hanna, and all this. He played as classical. He had a classical collection that was unbelievable, operas, and he knew all that music. Yeah. We listened to more classical music in his house than we ever listened to jazz. Uh -huh. You know, he loved Rubenstein. He got me onto the Rubenstein. I read both of Rubenstein's books and went to see him about five times. Arthur Rubenstein yeah. was his piano player. You yeah. know? And he knew all those pieces. He knew all those pieces. Yeah. If you made a mistake, he knew it. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 He knew that music. And we'd sit up there and listen to that music and we'd talk about it. I learned a lot about that music from mm -hmm. him. You know, just listening and how to listen to it, and uh, and uh, he loved the piano. If you have noticed, only any of his albums, the piano player always plays a lot. Any Coleman yeah. Hawkins yeah. albums, the piano player always plays a lot, because he loved the piano. He loved to listen to it. He said, uh -huh. and we had a great relationship also. But it was like I said, different. Yeah. He went down to, <laughs> you know, they have the, he went down to. Um, he loved big cars. And fancy things, you know, he paid, you know, fancy suits and shoes. And coats. And and coats, and fancy yeah. clothes, you know. And he went down, to, right down here on Broadway and bought an Imperial, this would be a Chrysler showroom, right here on Broadway, right not far from this hotel, right there at Broadway around 55th Street or something. Chrysler showroom. He went down there and bought one of those big Chrysler 300s. And he didn't even have any license. And he had the guy drive it up and put it in the lot where he lived on Central Park West. They had a parking thing there, put it there. You know, nobody ever drove that car but me. That's right. And he loved me that much, man. He, nobody ever drove that car but me. When he died, I don't know what happened to that. He, nobody ever drove that car but me. I'll be turned. That's right. Stanley Dad said, I called up Coleman Hawkins. I said, man, I want you to come down here midtown and meet me. I want to talk to you about something. So he says, uh, well, you want to call Eddie Locke up? He says, but I don't want to talk to Eddie Locke, Coleman. I want to talk to you. He said, this guy wouldn't come unless you came. <laughs> 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 he was. We were, I mean, that was like, that's what I'm saying. He loved me just the, the way Roy did, but it, it was a little, it was different, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And he, nobody ever drove that car but me. It was a beautiful car. Well. And he was a, you know, he, anytime he wanted to know something, he'd be on the road with Jazz Philharmonic. And they'd be talking about music or something. So I'm going to call up Locke to see. He called me from on the road. Can I say, man, let me call up Eddie Locke for He's got Oscar Peterson there and all these different guys. He's calling him up to ask him something. <laughs> oh, he darn. Wow. Yeah, that was, that, was, that was something, yeah. I was just, like I said, I was just someone unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Tell me about how a typical recording session would happen for you guys and, and then how much time it took. Well, that's what, that's what, the, when we go to those, we used to go to those, all those records that we made, every one of them that we made with that quartet, we go there and the guy would bring us like a, no, with no right range, a song sheet, you know, like you buy in the store. He'd give everybody a song sheet. Which guy would give Who, you a Somebody, they had our man, whoever, you know, would, would, would got the date from the company. Oh, they picked the songs? Yeah. Oh, with most of those uh -huh. songs, we never, he, that's what was amazing about him. How he could interpret those songs, you and nobody believes. When I tell musicians, some young musicians this, they don't mm. believe it mm. because these guys they rehearse for months before they do a yeah. record date. Right. You know, what's no arrangement? What's not? Nobody wrote a couple of things. One, the, the album wrapped tight. Their arrangements, mm -hmm. but other than that, that the one, fam the one I love the most, that uh, today and now, 
with the love song from Apache, the movie. Remember the movie, the Apache with Burt Lancaster? Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's, we played the theme of that movie, uh -huh. the love song from Apache. And they just brought the thing there, and we played it, man. And it's so beautiful. I know that the, the introduction Tommy played on that, a guy I know, young piano player, that did his thesis at Yale on the introduction. Oh, my gosh. It was so beautiful. You suppose the the A um, and R guy or producer, whomever was was picking tunes that they thought would fit help his sell the record. Well, I guess it fit the way he played. I guess that's what they were doing, because he played that song so beautiful, man. Mm. I mean, that, that's my one of my favorite albums that we made was Today and Now. It's beautiful music on there, and that love song from Apache was on there. Well, some other thing, Quintessence, the Quincy Jones tune. Mm -hmm. And I remember Monk used to always come up there, because, you know, Monk loved Coleman. He loved Coleman Hawkins. And he was different when he was around Coleman Hawkins, you know? I mean, he talked, and he, you know, asked him questions. How do you like my shoes, or how do you like my coat or my pants, you know? You know, they wow. were, you know what I mean? And he was up, and he used to come up there, and, and one time he came up there, and we were, we were, Coleman was playing this album. He said, you got some kind of secret music up here, haven't you? <laughs> secret music. He said, what kind of music you guys playing? <laughs> and we used to play opposite Monk all the way time down at the Village Gate mm -hmm. when, it was, when it was really big. They used to have two or three groups at a time. You know, guys don't even know about that in New York now. And uh, we'd be like Monk and Coleman Hawkins and Mingus' band sometime, you know. And Monk would always go up on the stage, you know, by himself first. And he would say, da, 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 da. You know, he was trying to coach Bean. He wanted Bean to play with him, but he wouldn't ask him, you know. Coleman said, listen at him up there. You know he what he he's doing, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> but he, uh, he used to come up there, and uh, Coleman and him, they would be talking. And it would be wonderful to hear him, to hear him talking to somebody that he, lo he loved Coleman so much, because those, Coleman did help all those young mm -hmm. guys when they were young, you know. Yeah, well, was. I had not heard that before, you know, like Monk being so uh, kind of enamored of oh, he somebody was enamored. that Oh, that he, he was. Went. Oh, uh, yeah. He said, how you like my shoes, Bean? How you like my pants, you know, <laughs> my suit, you know? They all dressed, you know. If uh -huh. you know those guys of that period, because Coleman yeah. Hawkins, those guys, that's where they love to dress. And so these guys all picked that up from them. Uh-huh. Did you call him Bean? Was that, or was that? I, did I call him, yeah, I call him Bean sometime, yeah. and sometimes I call him Hawk, you know. Yeah, okay. There wasn't with the nicknames. Um, I was curious if there was something like, you wouldn't use a nickname unless you were kind of friends with him or in a yeah, well, I, I, he was like my, I mean, I, we, we was more than a friend. Right. I mean, I was, like I said, I was so close to those two guys mm -hmm. for, my, for somebody my age. Yeah. When he died, Time Magazine called me up. And you know, he said, he said they said, you know who told us to call you? We couldn't believe why he told us. We had called Benny Carter to ask him something about Coleman Hawkins. And he said, man, if you want to know anything about Coleman Hawkins, he said, you call Eddie Locke. Mm -hmm. I, and they couldn't figure that out because it was, he was a peer of theirs. So they figured if anybody knew anything about him, they yeah. would know more than I did. But mm -hmm. I knew more about him than a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think, you know, I just asked my wife and I've asked other people. Because I treated him, I guess, he had to watch him because I just treated him like another person. You know what I mean? We did funny things mm -hmm. together and laughed and all kind of stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. I didn't treat him like he was this idol, and I think that's what I think that that's the only thing I can figure why he really liked me to be around him so much. Yeah, he didn't need that from you. He no, just, he liked. Yeah, to that's have a normal. Norm, kind of it was a normal buddy thing. Right. And a little father, you know, he was like, you know, he, he always was encouraging. You know, I I learned how to write. I learned how to write music because I. Because I never studied music, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, but I learned all the chords and all that stuff, you know. Just and he was so. That's what another thing about those guys. I he'd be back in the kitchen in his apartment. And I'd be in the and I might just play a triad, like a C. And he said, "Yeah, Locke, that's good." You know what I mean? And, but he wouldn't be playing the BS me. And he and I got a book called, um, you know, like those little favorite 
how they take classical pieces and make them shorten them and put them mm -hmm. in these books. Mm -hmm. And he had one of them. And, I, and he said, you get one of these books. And he, it was one of those chordal Chopin things. It's all chords, you know. He said, now, you're going to learn how to play that. And I said, I am. He said, yeah. And then when, when these Tommy or Barry or Monk's up here, I'm going to make you play it and get them. I'm going to say, now, look, here's a drummer can play this, and you guys can. <laughs> And I did learn it, yeah. I swear to God. It took me a long time, but I did learn it. Mm -hmm. I could play it, I could play it. It was all chordal. Da, 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 di, da, da, ya, da, 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 some of those yeah. things like that, yeah. you know? And I, I can't do it now, because you have to, that's one thing about that music, <laughs> you have to practice every day. <laughs> right. But that was just, but the, for someone to believe, that's what I always tell people, that someone that great believed that I could do it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I did it. That's the environment thing yeah. that I was talking about before. And I did it. Man, you have been with some of the greats. Oh, boy. That's a great, that. great story. What do you think people liked about your drumming? That's what I used to ask Roy. I asked Roy. I said, I knew what he liked. Because my time is good. It's still, it's funny. It's my, <laughs> Earl May tells me this now all the time. He says, man. He said, no, man, none of these drummers can't do that thing on that cymbal like you, man. He said, I play a lot of guys now, man. Ever since I've been playing with you now, he said, that, that thing is something. He said, I don't, he said, these drummers can't do it. And that's, I always had that. Mm -hmm. I, I could always swing, because that's, that's why, I, you know, sometimes I said to myself, if I hadn't had this natural talent, I might have studied more. And I might have been, you know how you yeah. reminisce about what you could have. Right. But I don't think that would have been. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I think things happen just the way they're supposed to happen in your life. You know? Because a guy called me from Atlanta. His name is Hank Moore. Played tenor around Detroit, but he lives in Atlanta now. And I haven't seen him in 30 years, probably. But he knew. And me, him, and Doug Watkins, you know, the bass player to play with Horace Silver and all. We were in a little band in Detroit, blues band. We had a little band, you know. And uh, he said, man, I said, yeah, he's, this was just lately. In the last couple months, he called me. We was talking. I hadn't talk. He said, I said, yeah, man, we sure had a great man. He said, you know what, Lon? I said, what? He said, you always could swing. <laughs> and so I guess that's what they, what they mm -hmm. liked. They were like, uh, actually, I, like I told you, I'm playing better now than I ever played. Because I used to never practice. I started practicing. Uh -huh. Arthur Taylor used to get on me, you know, before he died. When he moved back here, we got to be very close. He said, Locke, man, you don't practice. You got to practice. He was on a, some people like to practice. Mm -hmm. And he was one of those guys that practice all the time. But I never really liked to practice. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and, but, and simply because I had this natural ability to do things. Yeah. But that only keeps you at a certain level. Right. If you don't practice. But now, like I said, I, ever since he started me doing that, been over the last 10 years or 15 years, mm -hmm. I've been practicing. Oh, and I know the difference. Good, good. You know. Yeah. But I, I'm glad I didn't practice. Maybe if I had practiced too much before, I might have lost that thing that everybody likes. <laughs> too much technique. <laughs> yeah. Well, Joe Jones is the funniest thing I ever heard in my life. He said, you got to, when I first met him, and I never heard anybody say that before, he said, you got to unlearn yourself. I never heard that before. Oh. It took me a long time to figure it out, but I know I understand it now though. You gotta unlearn yourself. You know. Uh, and uh, I got a book, Leonardo da Vinci, because I like art too. I paint and draw and uh, somebody gave me the Leonardo Leonardo da Vinci notebooks. Mm -hmm. And in, in somewhere in there he said, Never let uh, never let theory outstrip the performance. Yeah. And that's what those guys always did. The performance. Papa Joe Jones, he said, he used to always say this, and I know what he meant now. When you could see one of these drummers or somebody or somebody talking, he said, Let's look what, hey, he said, let me get them on a stage. Mm -hmm. I don't care if they're fast hands or nothing like yeah. that. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a performance. That's what those guys could do when they got on that stage. I mean, I've seen Roy Eldridge do things that people I've never seen nobody else do that I played with. It's, I mean, just ordinary people. He says, no jazz fan. See, they didn't think about it like these guys, people talking about it. It's not, these are just people, man. You make them feel good. 
All those guys were like that. Uh -huh. They make them feel good, man. They'll come. They'll come back. There's no thing to dance. They don't help that about no jazz fan. Just play. Yeah. Let's just play. Like when when he went in Ryan's, when, we, when Roy went in Ryan's, everybody says, Roy Eldridge, oh, man, he's not going to make it a Dixieland place. You know what I mean? Yeah. Roy never played no Dixieland music before. You know what I mean? Yeah. Man, he swung that stuff, man, like it was, you know, after you gone. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's what those guys could do, man. Yeah. It's the music. They make the music sound good, you know, anything. I mean, the music. You're making the music, whatever mm -hmm. kind of song. Guys say, oh, I don't like this song. I don't, man, let's play. That's what they used to tell me. They got me out of all of those bad habits. Yeah. You know, can you play? If you can play, you can play any song and make it sound good. And that's what they could do. I don't think anything, anything they played. It was amazing. I mean, with Coleman, it's like I tell you all those songs, we made the music to No Strings. You might have heard that. that that show was on Broadway for a yeah. little while. Yeah. We made the music that we were the only one person. We had told me that Nep has never seen that music. And they brought the song sheets, just like I said. Yeah. And I told a young piano player about that. He liked that album. He said, he didn't believe me. He said, man, you guys had to rehearse that music. You didn't. I said, never. We went right to the record date. We didn't even know what we were going to do. We went there. That's, that's quite amazing. It is. <laughs> It is. It is. Every time I think about it, because now when I'm around musicians and I see them and they're struggling with all this music all the time, yeah. and, that, and I, I think of all the music that guy I made with that guy, and never was no struggle. <laughs> hmm. It was never no struggle. You had to have an amazing empathy with the musicians and that's right. listening that, there you skills, go. right? There you go. That's yeah. it. That's it. But that's what makes the music nice. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just like we were talking about that rhythm checking with Count Basie, that's what that was. Yeah. The empathy between uh -huh. the guys, you know. Wow. You know, you've seen um, jazz go through a lot of things. Lots of things. Was there a time <clears throat> in your career <clears throat> where you felt jazz was going in like the wrong direction? Oh, a lot of times I, yeah. I thought it was going wrong. Yeah. And for the, the same reason that I think that. Um, That if whatever kind of not the, it's not the kind of music you play that I don't like. I think it's the way you play it that I don't like. Like people play. <laughs> I've heard guys play, you know, like they say, you know, like as they say the avant-garde stuff. It wasn't so much that I disliked what they were playing as it was the way they were playing it. You know, that harshness they had with the uh -huh. music. You know. It is, uh, they play ugly, you know, you don't have to play yeah. ugly. You can be creative and do all that stuff without being ugly, too. You know, if you want to be far out or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mingus did that, he, wouldn't, he didn't play ugly. He play, you know, he was like, like, way out before anybody was doing all that yeah. stuff, you know what I mean? Yeah. But it, it wasn't ugly. You know, he had the, you know, beauty in, his, mm -hmm. in, the, in the stuff. That's, that's the part I don't like, when it's not pretty. I like. That's a good observation. It's like almost the musicians, if they're going to get rid of the harmonic limitations yeah. and the time, does that mean you have to play ugly? Right. That's the thing. Yeah. That's what I don't like. That's, yeah. that's the part. That's the, that's the thing. Hmm. You know? And I've seen so many instances where, you know, when, when they, they put names on the music, when they put a name on the music, then it, it tends to make younger guys think that they got, should do something else with the music mm -hmm. when they put a name on it, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I always remember Connie Kay telling me when he, you know, he loved Sid Catlett and he used to follow Sid. I never knew Sid Catlett because he died young. But he was like Papa Joe. They had kind of had the same kind of approach to the drums. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and so uh, Connie Kay said, I used to follow this cat around everywhere. So he said, one day I was winning, man. We went down, he took me down to Birdland. And he went in there and sat in, you know, with somebody who was man's playing. He said, tore the joint up. Sid did. He got, took me and said, come on, boy. He took me, put me in a car, and he drove down in the village. And he was going into Nick's. Now, that's a Dixieland place, right? <laughs> he said, I said, asked him, I said, what are you going in here for? You know, because he's you hip. You know, what are you going in this Dixieland place? You know what I mean? So he said, Connie Casey, he went in there, he sat in, and he tore it up in there, too. <laughs> Ding, right? If you're good, that's, that's it, right? You went to Birdland, 
and they loved him in there. He went down there, and they loved. He said, "Kind of can't say that was a great lesson." Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's yeah. it. That's what it's about. That's the thing about having this, this just touch and all this feeling yeah. for the music. You know, yeah. it'll fit anywhere. Fit anywhere. Yeah. Anywhere. Yeah. Um, a couple different recordings I wanted to ask you about. Okay. Uh, Playing with Earl Hines. Oh, but that was, you know? that was something. That Live at the Vanguard. Yeah. I, but I, that's one of my favorite things that I made. And uh, I, I, it was almost the same kind of thing. He was the nicest man. He was the nicest guy, man. He, I mean, he was, whoo. You know, he was the nicest person. Really? Oh, man. And we never rehearsed with, I never rehearsed with him either. It was Bud Johnson, Gene Ramey, and me. We played with him. That was that was quite an experience. Mm -hmm. He was a dynamic. I mean, he was he was so dynamic on that piano. It was just like, woo, you know. I mean, it was like a whole band. <laughs> <laughs> you, know I mean? you never knew what he was going to do. It yeah. was not no. <laughs> you had to really stay on your toes, man. Especially a drummer, because his thing was, you know, he was all between the beat and all kind of things, you know, when he played. <laughs> I mean, I remember one time we were down in Washington, D.C., and he was riding around. Rain just came off his finger, man, went out into the audience. Wow. <laughs> this, I mean, his just left hand was just working, you know, so hard, man. See, that's what those guys played. They were, like, in it. Yeah. And his rain come off his <laughs> Oh, Wow. That was amazing. Yeah. I, that's why I said I was just about the luckiest guy, mm -hmm. man, about like that, that have been, that have had those experiences with that, that caliber of people. Yeah. Not only as musicians, but as people, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think about the, um, we're in this building right now, and there's <laughs> all these uh, things going on yes. with jazz. Yes. And, uh, a lot of people, lots of uh, ways to teach being talked about and so forth. Does it, how does it strike you? I don't get it. Because, see, I don't believe you can teach anyone to play jazz. You can teach them how to play an instrument. You can teach them how to play. Because I teach at a school here in New York myself. Mm -hmm. I like kids. I've been doing that all my life. Mm -hmm. You know, they talk about this education thing. I had the first presidential scholar in jazz. A lot of people don't even know that. It was written, it was written up in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. I had the first presidential scholar in jazz. They had, you know, they have presidential scholars every year in academia. You know that. Yes. So high school kids, seniors. Yeah. And I had the first one in jazz. Went to Washington, D.C. and went to the White House where Reagan was in office. But I never taught him jazz. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I just taught him the, about the music and let him listen to the music. I never, and I teach at a school called the Trevor Day School now, mm -hmm. over on the, on the East, East 90th Street. I've been there for 18 years because the headmaster, his name is uh, Jack Dexter, Dr. Dexter, he, he loves jazz. So I've been there, Roy Eldridge has played there, but Frank West, Roland Hanna, I've had everybody play there. Every year I give two concerts mm -hmm. for the kids, you know, with that caliber of musicians. Yeah. And, uh, so I'm, I'm, I've always been around kids, and I love kids, but I never tell a kid I'm teaching them how to play jazz. And I got a lot of them that can really play, mm -hmm. but I never, I just say, you, you got to go find your own thing, what you want to play. I taught you, I've tried to teach you the fundamentals of the instrument or whatever that is, and then you go find where you could play. Go listen, go look, find. You know, this thing with this building, what you're talking about, this, this jazz, I think what I believe myself, my personally think, it's just become a big business now. Uh -huh. It has nothing to do with jazz now to me. This jazz education thing has become a big, big business. Almost every big college now has got a, a, got a jazz studies thing in it. Right. You know? And some of these kids, are, uh, Phil Woods wrote an article in the Union paper about it, too. One time, a long time, in the American Federation Musician paper about, you know, about this, what, what, what are they doing, you know, with this stuff that, that, that everybody can't play jazz. Mm -hmm. Like everybody can't play baseball. Right. 
or everybody can't, you know what I mean? And they're giving this impression that if you do this, you can play jazz. That's not true. You can't ever, you, 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 jazz is, uh, is a life experience also. It's about your living, the way you live. As, as Joe Jones used to tell me, he said, you got to have something to bring to the music. You got to bring something to the music. You know, after you learn, you have to bring something to the music. So you have to live a life to bring something to the music. You just can't sit in no practice room all day long and don't uh -huh. I had a great experience. I was out at one of those schools out, I think I was in Jersey where they got a jazz program and, and I met this drummer. So, so I said, he said, uh, we, I played a concert with somebody I don't remember and so we started talking to the, you know, some of the students. And so he says, well, I'm trying to find some, where can I go play? So I said, well, are you going to the school, right? I said, well, don't, don't, you, don't you guys play? He said, no, man. Nobody, we don't play together. Most of the time, the guys are just in the practice room. They're just all practicing by themselves. Mm. I said, well, that doesn't make much sense because when you get out of here, that should be required that you all guys play together because when you get out of here, you got to play with somebody. You're not yeah. going to be playing by yourself. And it's a whole lot of things. The only way you're going to learn it is if you're playing with somebody. It's not going to happen in the practice room. Mm -hmm. Because you bring in this, everybody's going to have their little, you know, you've got all these different people now. They're all different, and now you've got to make this all fit together. That's, that's what they, I don't find these guys can do now that study these jazz courses. Yeah. When they get on the stage, it don't work. It doesn't work together. Is they working individually? But that's not what jazz is supposed to be about. Mm -hmm. You know, it's supposed to be about us making this thing together, you know. Having that empathy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hey, hey, you yeah. know, it's not about how much better you can play than me or how much more technique you got than I got and all this kind of stuff, you know what I mean? This us to make this stuff work, you know? Yeah. You guys say, well, man, you guys, this, this little group that I'm playing with, you guys, I say, well, are we trying to make it work, man? That's all, that's why it's working. Mm-hmm. And that's what those guys did. They made it make it work. If it, something was going wrong, man, they wouldn't just keep beating on it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. They would say, hey, yeah, well, let's just do something yeah. else then, man. You know what I mean? Right. And nobody can do everything. <laughs> and you're human. Yeah. And you have your frail things about yourself. Everybody's personality has something weakness in it. Uh -huh. You know, but you go to their strength <laughs> instead of their weakness. You don't say, keep telling the guy to keep doing this. And you see, he yeah. can't do it. So why just keep doing it? Yeah. When I got a kids, when I'm teaching in my school, I have kids be playing something. He can't get it. I say, boom! I'll find something else he can play. Uh -huh. And then play something. That's build this. You you don't keep telling me do 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 do. That's not helpful to nobody. Mm -hmm. You know. I mean, and I, it's, it's, you, you, you can't teach anybody anything like that. Every time he comes, he feels, when he leaves, he's like, oh, I couldn't do that. Uh -huh. I always have something they can do good all the time, and I let them play that. Yeah. And then I add something else to it. Right. You know what I mean? And I've had very good success with that. And I'm not trying to make them musicians. I'm trying to make them good human beings, mm. first of all. Yeah. The, the, that, that other part is up to them. I can't make them like that. And that's what those guys taught me, by being around them. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're still a, a lifelong learner. I think I, I know you're excited about a new group that I am, you got I going. Am, I am because that's the way they were. Yeah. I mean, come on, cause you know, like a, Tommy or Barry would play a chord. He said, "What is that you just played there?" You know, and I'm this guy's playing with everybody. He's one of the greatest sex one. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. He never. He always had that. You know. <laughs> yeah. He said, "I heard that." <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> You would think this guy would be, and Roy was the same way, you know. He'd sit in the dressing room with you, man. you get some brushes or sticks, and he would get his horn out, put the mute in, and he was ready to, you know, you know what I mean? That's great. <laughs> These guys have been all over the world. They've been the plays of the greatest people in the world, mm -hmm. and they were still like that. Yeah. You know, that, and that was, that's amazing. They would play with anybody. They'd go some little joint, man, and tear it up. You know, there's some little bitty place. There wouldn't have been a whole lot of people there. That's the difference. That's what I. That, that's another part of it. That's like we had the record in a half note one time down there. It used to be a place out on Spring and Hudson Street. We stayed in that place for 13 weeks with Roy Eldridge, and people were just coming. They were just lining up because you know why? They just had so much fun, man. When they left, they just. 
I remember one time they said we were behind a bar with some steps, man, and this this man just he just ran up the steps and just got on his knees, boy, and just did like this, like it was like he was in church. Uh -huh. He was so happy. Yeah. That was that's that's what made jazz great. Uh huh. Because it made people happy. You have to go to this. Now what chord is that he's playing there? And what kind of beat is that he's doing over there? You know. <laughs> I, Joe Jones says. I said Joe. I said how should I hold my sticks? You know what he told me? He said, any way you can play with them. <laughs> oh, God. That's great That's lessons good. I got. That's good. <laughs> I, you know, I congratulate you on the, on the part you had in, in the creation of all this great music, too. Thank you. So, I did a little bit, but yeah. I did my little bit. I, I added what I could add a little bit. Just like they, I was telling you what they told me is the truth. You just keep doing what you can do. And it was true. That's what's so amazing. I didn't understand as much as I do now that mm -hmm. what you can do, man, that's, that's good. You know, this other guy could do that. But what you're doing is good. Now, mm -hmm. we like that. That's what yeah. they used to always say, Coleman and Roy. They would both say that. They would they'd both say that to me at different times, you know. Excellent. It was. You know, it was, it was, I'm going to stop because I'm running my mouth so much. It's, <laughs> Well, I'll never forget one time we were there was a bar called the Copper Rail. Mm -hmm. It was right across the street from the Metropole. There used to always be a lot of bars like that in New York where the musicians just came. You know, they came there because they knew it, it, from the Metropole, if when the guys got off the mission, everybody was going to come over there. You know? And I know there was a great drummer now. I'm not going to use no names, but anyway, it was a great drummer then. He had went to Roy. I was playing with Roy and Coleman together at that time. And I um, asked him, could he sit in with him? He was a great drummer, something I admired too. And they said, it came over one of them. It was either Royal Coleman says, man, you mind if this drummer? I said, no, no, Coleman. You know, I mean, I was, I, I don't mind if they, he sits in, you know. And then about, uh, about 15 minutes later, Coleman came over to me and says, no, 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 I'm not going to. He said, you know what he said? I like what you're doing, man. <laughs> I'm not going to let him sit in. You come on back over here. Wow. Oh, man, you don't know what that it's, did to me yeah. inside, man. It just melted me. You know, as it was like, oh, wow. He said, we, we like what you're doing, man. Don't, don't, we don't, you, know, you, come, you come back over here and play. Mm. That was beautiful. That was like, that's the kind of people they were. Yeah. That's the kind of people they were. It was wonderful. Um, and I was lucky. And, and like I said, the, and the, every one of the records I made with Coleman Hawkins and Roy, because I made some good records with Roy, too. You know, that record I made with him that, um, with uh, Oscar Peterson and Ray Brown called Happy Times. Mm -hmm. You ever hear that one? Yeah. Where he sings? Oh, yeah, that's right. He He's, you know what he told me? It's so funny. He said, I said, I mean, because I was like shocked when he called me and told me that I, he wanted me on this date with those guys, you know? I said, whoa. <laughs> you know what I mean? He said, I just want to see a friendly face. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he didn't tell me, you're so great and all this yeah. stuff. He said, you know where I got you? I just wanted to see a friendly face. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right. And I knew, and I wasn't even worried about it because I was with him. You know, because that was heavy company to be in. Joe mm -hmm. Pass was on there too. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's like getting thrown in the lion's den, yeah. you know, because those guys were very tight together, you know. But I played with him because that was my man. Mm -hmm. I know he would not. He would protect me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know? Yeah. 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 And it came out good, though. Yeah. You know? Because he was what I was with. Yeah. You know? Because some musicians get you on know, dates like that, that they try to intimidate you, you know? A lot of people get intimidated by people like that. Sometimes, mm -hmm. and they do it on purpose sometimes, you know? But I knew I had my buddy, my, my, right. my best, right? And it was a good record. It's a good record. But I was just, like I said before, I thank God I was just a lucky guy, man. And I've tried to pass it on to other people, yeah. young people. That's why I work with young, do things with young people. I try to tell them some of the stuff that I, all that knowledge that I got, because you can't get it nowhere else. And that's what, what about the jazz education thing? See, they can't get that because they have never did it. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, some of these people, when, that, when this jazz education first started, the people that were teaching it, most of them were jazz musicians that had played it. Now it's people that just went to college and studied, yeah. and they're teaching it yeah. from that perspective. 
but it's a whole nother ball game. It's yeah. some, it's something else, you know. I asked when I was up at the school. I told you up there when I and this a young drummer asked me when I was up at Schenectady, one of those schools, and the girl asked me was asked me about that be that thing, you know. And uh, so I asked him. I said, "Do you know how to play the three camps?" He said, "What's that?" Mm. Every drum of my period knew what that was. Yeah. That's like an E2 kind of thing for the drum. Rudiments, drums. right? Yeah, all, yeah. all five rows. Roll. You know, it's a story. You know, and mm -hmm. every drummer could play that. And he didn't know that. So that's why he can't play the thing. Because that's, a, that's all of these things you learn. He doesn't have control of his hands. Mm -hmm. That's like in any instrument. I mean, if you can't control the instrument, then you got to, you got to have control. That's what they call a stick control, and you got to learn that from the basic, rudimental parts of the instrument. You know, but don't forget the pendulum when you go yeah, back to school. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's something. Every time I tell the teacher, I tell the teachers up there, and they say, "I never heard of that before." <laughs> I said, "I know." So that's what that's what I'm talking about when I say that the jazz was. Was, came from another place, not mm -hmm. just from in school. Yeah. And the part, that, another part about this education thing that makes me feel real terrible sometimes is that the way they talk about some of this stuff now, like the musicians from the period that I came up in, the swinger that I idolized, like they weren't educated musicians. Uh huh. You understand? I mean, the, uh -huh. the way they present it, almost like this. Now these guys can play classical music and. I, uh -huh. Hey man, those guys were. I mean, Coleman Hawkins was a very, very, mm -hmm. very. I mean, unbelievable educated musician. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them was Buster Bailey, they played the clarinet. He was a classical clarinet player. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, these guys, but they, they didn't talk about it like they do now. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? Right. They didn't use the, all the terminology. Some terminology all about that, like, you know, <laughs> it's like weird. And it's, and it's because jazz is special. And just because you can play the instrument doesn't mean you can play jazz. Yeah. And that's what I don't like about this, all this stuff, because it's taking jazz somewhere to... Where it doesn't need to go. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. It's taking it somewhere where it doesn't need to go, you know? Right. And I miss all those people because those people, that, the, you don't have that feeling with these people that learn that way. They have a whole nother thing about the communication. They don't mm -hmm. talk to each other. They don't laugh. You know, everybody's on the bandstand like, you know, like they're getting ready to have an attack or something, you know what I'm <laughs> saying? Man, when I was on the bandstand with Roy and them, man, it would be, having, it would be so much fun. It was yeah. like, whoa. <laughs> you know? <laughs> i never forget what J.C. Heard was playing. When I first heard Coleman and Roy in Metropole, J.C. Heard was still playing. You remember him? Mm -hmm. He was a great drummer, man. That was one of those other kind of people, man, too. And, uh, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm going to tell you one more story. <laughs> when I went to high school in Detroit, you know, he's from Detroit, too. Uh -huh. And when he was with Cab Calloway, the teacher that I had had taught at another school where he did go, but he had transferred the teacher. So he told the guys in the drum class, because we taught them in a class. Everybody had a pad on a desk, and the guy was up front. And he said, I'm going to go down to the theater, and I'm going to bring the drummer with Cab Calloway's band back to do a little thing for you guys. Oh, man. And he did. He brought J.C. Heard, And I was like, I mean, I had never seen nobody so dressed up before in my life, only in the movies, you know. It was, he was so, he was one of those guys who was immaculate. All those guys were sharp. I was just, just like, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I love the drum, but the clothes, it just had me like, and dump. You know, I wouldn't got a job. I wouldn't got a job in a restaurant washing dishes. And I went to this store downtown in Detroit called King Brooks that had very expensive clothes. And I picked out everything that close as I could to what he had on and paid $5 every week, every week on it until I got it. Oh, wow. I copied it's... everything he wore. That's how much I, I was impressed. Mm -hmm. You know? And that's the kind of things that you don't see happens no more. Yeah. You know what I yeah. mean? It's like, I think that's the kind of things that make you play music. But that's the jazz. That's, that is the jazz part of right. it. You know what I'm saying? But th th this is the funny part. When then I met him at the Metropole, right? Mm -hmm. So he was playing with the Grunt and Coleman and them, you know. 
And I, that's when I was playing in the afternoon, but I used to hang around at night to watch those guys play, too. <laughs> and he came off the stage, and I told him, I said, you know what, J.C.? I said, man, when I was going to high school, he said, I said, you know, man, I got your autograph. And he said, don't you tell nobody that, man, old as you are. <laughs> 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 it's good. He said, you tell them like that, man, old as you are. Well, this has just been the greatest time. I really appreciate you coming in and, and uh, well, thank, and, you and having, me. thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. It's been great. Thank, thank you. So. <laughs>